here's what's going on today. I'm gonna give you guys the lowdown. It's gonna be a little bit complicated, very emotional, and so infuriating. Please watch through the end of this video because I feel like there's points where we might seem dramatic and overreacting, but when you get the full picture and the full story, it's absolutely bonkers. So this is like the full comprehensive abridged version of how Mia ended up in the PICU with RSV, which is like this vi virus mm -hmm. that affects children and her heart stopped twice. Because in my opinion, in my humble opinion, because of how shitty this hospital was, like mind boggling to me. <laughs> we're exposing some people today. That's how we're starting this video because what the actual f going on. The past couple of weeks have been fuckery in our lives. Primarily my sister and Andrew of us. <laughs> like, we were on the sidelines watching this all go down and it was, this only happens in movies. This happens in like those documentaries of like exposing hospitals and then it happened to us. This doesn't happen to normal people. It's yes. just in the dramas, in Grey's Anatomy or whatever. I would say that both of you guys have PTSD. They are going to therapy. Yes. <laughs> it's really intense. So let me just walk you guys through what happened because I feel like this story is so important and normally we never talk about like, oh my God, this like company did this and like these people did this. We never like to talk about it, but like, I think it's important to advocate for patient safety in hospitals, especially children, especially when they're like not even six months old and they can't even talk for themselves. I'm gonna try to like walk you guys through the story and then my sister's gonna pick up on like the really intense parts. When I got a phone call from my mom and she's like, oh, Mia's sick. I thought it was gonna be like a Sophie situation. Like, oh, I feel so bad, but like she's gonna be fine, she's a tank. But then the next day I get a call from my sister and she is like, not hysterical. It was honestly creepy because she's so calm and collected. She's like, I'm getting in the ambulance right now. You need mommy to meet me at the children's hospital. Like, this is what's gonna happen. I need her to bring A, B, C, and D. Meet me, like she was on top of her shit, right? So I'm like, <gasps> I'm freaking out, but I can't freak out too much because she's not freaking out. They get to the emergency room. I'm thinking, okay, I just need to like bring things for me and my sister. Like, I'm still thinking it's a cute little hospital visit. I don't know why. I thought she was going to the emergency room because maybe like the pediatrician wasn't open, right? I was wrong. The pediatrician was open. Like she literally needed to go to the children's hospital and be ambulance there. Instantly, was she just hooked up to a bunch of machines or? We went to the pediatrician, yeah. they hooked her up to oxygen, and because her oxygen kept falling, they were like, oh, you have to take the ambulance to the hospital so that they can transport her on oxygen. In so the what was her room. condition like at home? It was just like a normal cold. She was just coughing. At that age, there's nothing that you can really do. She just has to go through the process of being sick and it'll yeah. go away because there's no medication you can give them. The night before, she started like wheezing and breathing really hard. So they say that, I mean, I didn't know at this point, but the um, most important thing to look out for is like when the muscles in between like their chest and their stomach like sucks in every time they breathe, like uh -huh. they shouldn't be doing that. And that's when you have to take them to the emergency room. Like, is it because they can't breathe well? Yeah, it means that they're like working really hard to breathe. And they tested her at the pediatrician's office for RSV. They say most children will get it before they're two, like 99 or whatever percent. Almost all children will get it, but most children, it'll just be like a cold and it'll go away. So you don't even know that it was RSV because you don't go yeah, to the doctor every time they have a cold. Did you the know what RSV was? I, I mean, I did, but I just didn't know that, it's that severe. Yeah, it could be that severe in yeah. the, like yeah. these cases. Why are parents not talking about this with the severity of like other things? Yeah. Actually, it's weird because in the hospital, they said that with Corona, RSV wasn't a thing for 18 months. So like they had like no cases of RSV. It's normally really common in the fall and winter, but now they're saying in the summer, like they're just having this crazy influx of RSV patients because everything's opened back up and the virus was like dormant, I guess. And they're thinking it mutated and became stronger and came back. They get to the emergency room. My mom is there and you know, my fiance and I were like rushing to pack a bag because my mom is like, I don't know what she needs. Just bring and everything. The minute that I get into the room where Mia was, and I don't know if this was like immediately the room that she was put into, but I have never seen a hospital room that big and that daunting in my entire life. They had the lights off. Yeah. There were machines suspended from the ceiling. Like the whole room was like 25 different Terminator machines. Yeah. And then the biggest 
picture and tiny little Mia and I okay I've heard the saying of like you never really understand like the feeling of being a parent until like your child is sick or whatever obviously I don't know because I don't have children I've never seen my sister like that in my entire 26 years of life I think we made eye contact one time and the whole time she was like on mom mode like just looking at Mia the whole time and I hear the nurse being like oh like Mia's little cheeks you know RSV is getting bad so I'm like RSV I take a little mental note immediately when I get out I'm googling the shit out of RSV and apparently it's like a very common thing for kids to get under two years old it's common in daycare mm -hmm. so it's common for kids to get it in daycare and then bring it home but because Mia was under six months she was at high risk to have like a severe case of it and then she was also considered premature because i had her you know yeah like a week earlier did you also look on reddit and stuff like i that? did was I mean, it, it's it, it pretty was terrifying. terrifying it's hard to know what parents are going through when your child's like that until you're going yep. through it yourself in the hospital literally an hour feels like a day so what was happening to me at like her ox she couldn't breathe on her yes. own so she couldn't breathe on her own her oxygen kept coming down so they were like okay we're gonna do a nasal cannula which is the oxygen that they put through your nose at some point they're like okay we need to do the one that's like covers her whole face during all of this she's still crying yes and because like, she's she still everything. awake and mia for one she will let you know when she's not comfortable <laughs> The turning point of that the hospital was really when in the middle of the night when we got there the doctors were actually like really reassuring us like you know it's something we see commonly and you know we have a lot of RSV cases and it's not like the progression the prognosis is not bad when did they tell you you have to stay overnight when they kept pumping more oxygen and they kept going up on the oxygen they were like okay well she's gonna get admitted and then i was like okay maybe we're gonna stay the night right that's what i thought until they were like okay she's on too much oxygen that she has to go to the icu i was like okay i'm gonna be here for at least a couple of days. So they get admitted into the PICU the night that they get to the emergency room. So they go in there, it's like an ICU, full around care, right? A lot of nurses coming in, constantly checking up on baby Mia, and then the progression just started getting worse. Like she could not breathe on her own, so it went from like the nose, to the pressure nose, to the mask, and then like a full on ventilator. That's like the last thing you would want in this situation. The crazy thing is, every single time, I would try to call my sister and I'm like, okay, like this is what I'm gonna say, right? I have it all mapped out in my head. I'm like, I read it on Reddit. Like all these people are like, it's getting better. Like, you know, it just, this is the worst. Every time I talk to her, before I can even get a word out, I'm like, how is she doing? It got worse. So I'm like, okay, wh what is happening? Everyone in the family was like freaking out. Like we didn't even know what to say at this point. I'm assuming the first night was horrible, but it was nothing compared to when she coded for the first time. Yes. I got a phone call at like 6 a.m. I have never felt that type of a stomach drop. I pick up and I don't even know what these words are. She's like telling me what's happening and I'm like so confused. She was on a ventilator which essentially acts like her lungs. So they put a tube down. Her mouth. Her mouth into her lungs. They have to sedate her in order for her not to breathe over the ventilator and fight it and be like super agitated and mad. And so they came to bathe her. Two nurses and a respiratory therapist came to bathe her. All of a sudden, I mean, at this point, we were thinking, oh, you know, we just have to go through the motion. It's just a process. She's gonna get worse and then she's gonna get better. But then all of a sudden, we wake up and it's like the machine's just going off like oh her oxygen's dropping and her pulse her heart rate is dropping like it's so loud it's like beep beep it like alerts it's like you. fire alarm yes it sounds like that so you woke up by like these crazy alarms yes and how how long after them bathing her was this they were in the process and then that happened. So the alarm went off while they were bathing her. Yes. And you thought, like, 
this is the safest time because she has two nurses and a respiratory yes. person yes. with her. So yes. I was like, oh my god, maybe her condition is just deteriorating. Like she's just mm -hmm. not getting better, and yeah. she, it's just she just has a really bad case of it. Her oxygen literally goes from like 90 something to like 70s, 60s, and it's like dropping to the 30s, <gasps> which it cannot. I mean, it shouldn't. So there's like this button on the wall, but they'll press the button and it'll literally. You know in the hospital in like dramas you're like you hear oh code blue and it says like a room number or whatever area and like literally they throw on all the lights 20 people come rushing into your room before any of this happened we would sleep through the nights and then it wasn't until that happened that me and her decided one of us always has to be up after that hours. happened it was one of us always has to be awake so the first time when the alarm went off you just woke up like what the f is happening? yeah i woke up i'm kind of like delirious at this point you know i'm like what the hell's going on there's literally like 30 people in our room. Literally her heart stopped. They're doing CPR on her. Dude, it was crazy. And the doctor's like calling out orders to do this and that. And they're doing CPR. I'm just, the chaplain comes in who's like the, I guess the minister that they have at the hospital. I was holding my hand like this, just like, oh my God, just praying that she makes it through this. It was like such a traumatic experience, yeah. honestly. Now after that, we were like, we can't let it happen again. So they did save her. Yes. At that point. They did. They said she was maybe without a pulse with, for four minutes. They said she self-extubated. Something happened and the tube came out. They're saying that it happened because she coughed the tube out. Yes. That's which, what they're saying. That's what they're saying. But what I do mean, you guys su we suspect? Don't, we don't I mean, know because at that point, <laughs> we were sleeping. But they're saying it's easy to self-extubate. I don't know how easy it is because she's not that small. But how did that happen if someone's watching after her? Yeah, see, that, yeah. that's the thing I don't really yeah. understand. Yes. This should be the time that she's the safest, right? Yeah. Yes. And I know like people might think we're being dramatic right now or like maybe we're trying to shift blame and we're not because my sister and Opa were literally there every single day 24 hours a day and they were watching Mia and if Mia didn't cough it up while they were watching them why did it happen under the watch of someone who's literally their job is to make sure that the, the tube stays in place but this is only the first incident. At this point, my sister, when she was talking to me, there was a little bit of like, kind of suspicion on our whole family's end of like, this is weird. Mm -hmm. That's really, like that makes us really nervous. Not yes. because we hate these people, but like, that's just weird. This is when Mia should be the safest in the hospital. So what happened after after she was back? Like, did the doctor say anything? Did they, like, I what, mean, what they, he they just said that the tube had come out and that was the reason that she coded and that he didn't think that it was her condition, like, just getting worse. It was really hard for us to tell whether the doctor was saying things to make us feel better or like this is like what they know. She was without oxygen for four minutes. So her brain wasn't getting oxygen, meaning that- It could it, cause permanent damage. And you don't know until later yeah. because she's too small to be tested. Yeah. No, it's not even too but, small. They say there's no test. She's oh, like, there's nothing available. we can do. There's no MRI, CT, or any tests available to test if she does have Damage. any kind of damage that's permanent or long lasting so you're saying even right now we don't know no. there's I don't, even, I don't even think we're gonna know later because she could just develop slowly even if this never happened and nobody would ever know yeah you it's know? like hard to say it's because of this yeah. and mm. like another thing that's so frustrating which you'll see why it's even more frustrating in a little bit it's not just the trauma and like the craziness of having her heart stop like her coding it's like you don't know what's gonna happen yes. in the future. Like this could literally have lifelong consequences. Yeah, so they decide that they're never gonna sleep. <laughs> like these two decide they're never gonna sleep. I think the first two days that my sister was there, she had like two bites of food and slept like a total of like one and a half hours. Where did you guys even lay down? Is there a bed? So there's like a sofa and then there's a reclining like chair. So the sofa. So he slept on the chair and I slept on the sofa. But my mom said the sofa 
but it's like a bench. Yeah, it's <laughs> no, a bench. It's, it's not a sofa. It's, we would have to like bring them lunch and dinner, but like they would never eat it. Which by the way, side note, this is one of the biggest children's hospitals in Atlanta that everybody trusted. The reviews are so good. Are they just freaking suing people? What's going on with these reviews? But regardless, the next incident happened. So she was under sedated again. By the way, my sister did not want Mia to be sedated. You gotta With the sedation, you gotta like, it's like such a balance because you mm -hmm. have to sedate them in yes. order for them to be on the ventilator. Like it's not an option not to sedate them. And then she was having a lot of mucus. So they were pulling the mucus out of her cause you can, because she has a tube, they're able to pull the mucus out. What I was day, standing right, so five days after the first incident. So 10 days into her hospitalization. So when we're finally like, oh, she's like doing so much better that day, right? It was that mm -hmm. day she was doing so much better. And then they do a night a shift change. Her numbers were getting higher, meaning like she had more mucus and they came to pull her mucus. She was agitated and we don't know what happened. Maybe it was when she was, the nurse was pulling the mucus out, but the ventilator started alarming. And when the thing alarms, you literally can't, it, it sounds like a fire alarm. This is not the same thing as the first. No, not the code. No. It's the ventilator machine itself mm -hmm. is doing an alarm. It's alarming and then it goes flat. So like before the ventilator was like, had like little oscillations because it was like measuring the pressure that was going in and the pressure that was coming out yeah. and it just flatlined. I'm like, this can't be normal. I mean, I'm no respiratory therapist or doctor. I don't, I don't know exactly how to read a ventilator, but I'm like, okay, this is not normal. Like it should not be flat like that. There's one nurse next to the ventilator and then on the other side of the bed, there's another, another nurse. And they are doing, they're pulling out the, the mucus from her. Yes. Okay. So it was alarming and the nurse just turns around, doesn't look at the ventilator and she just silences it. Right. And I'm like, but I look, I'm looking at the ventilator and it's like flat and it keeps saying check tubing Aut automatically. I'm like, she's not connected. Yeah. That's the first thing I'm thinking at first. I'm like, okay, she's going to look at it. She's gonna look at it. She's gonna look at the ventilator and see that she's not connected. And I wait for like 10 seconds and all of a sudden her oxygen is falling again. And I'm like, oh my God, this cannot be happening again. So I tell her, hey, the ventilator is saying, check the tubing, please check the tubing. And she brushes me off, she's like, it's okay. And doesn't even look at it again. At this point, I'm frustrated because she's going into that whole situation all over again and I just know it's coming. And she finally realizes it's not connected and she connects it back. That means she knows it wasn't connected. Yeah. She realizes it, right? So she didn't even check the tubing, just silence the alarm. Would you ever silence a freaking fire alarm when there's lives at stake and you didn't even look around for a fire? And I'm like, telling you. Yeah. I'm telling you I saw right a fire, here. guys. I'm like... Hey, it's like telling you this, like, please check it. She's like, it's okay. That's not the worst part. Okay. Like mistakes happen. The worst part, I'll tell you the worst part, but let me get, I guess, into what happens after that. Her oxygen falls and then her heart stops again. It's Are they still helpful. there? They're still there. Of course they could reconnected her, yes. but it's too late at that point. Okay. So, but so her heart, after they reconnect her, I don't know if it was a minute, 30 seconds, her heart stops again. They press that so traumatic button on the wall again and then 20 people come rushing into the room again. And then that nurse acts like the whole thing never happened. She doesn't tell anyone that she got disconnected from the ventilator. Still, she was like, oh, she just had a lot of mucus and she was really agitated. And that's what she said. Like trying she to didn't blame. say yeah. that she, yes. forget to, she forgot to plug in. Well, it's not that she forgot. It's like she got disconnected and she didn't tell anyone that she got disconnected. It could have been an accident, but still valuable information. The providers need to know when they're in a code blue situation where like her heart happened. stopped Completely and she different. just completely didn't tell anyone and act, tried to act like that ha never happened. But if you think about it, there's no way she didn't know that she wasn't connected because she's the one that reconnected it. Yeah. And I was course, right, standing right here. She tried alarm. to get yes. away with it. Yeah. She, so she tried to get away with it. But at the time, I just stood to the side because, I mean, the only thing after her heart stopped that I need them to do 
is just bring her back again. Yeah. I think they said it was like another four minutes. I'm not exactly sure. They brought her back again and her heart. So CPR. They did they, CPR. They did CPR again. They gave her medication that actually paralyzed her. So that way she wouldn't move because the nurse had made it seem like that was one of the reasons that she had went into the code. I was really upset about that, but it's like, I don't know how much infants will, like how much they'll remember from that because they're so young. But to a grown person who gets a paralytic when they're conscious, it's like, you're in, stuck in your own body. I mean, at this point, I'm livid because First of all, the accident, it happened, and accidents happen, and I get it. This is not like some, an order that I'm placing. This is my child's life. I'm like, please look at it. And then for her to kind of like brush me off, like it's okay, and not look at it, first of all, like that was upsetting. But then for her to not acknowledge that it, it happened was just, and try to brush it under the rug. And to put Mia's life at risk once again, yeah. when she didn't tell the doctors that ran in when she was code bluing. To me, that was like the biggest, like ha you have to have integrity as, you know, someone who's providing care for patients. In the healthcare industry, like that is not okay. As a parent, you feel so helpless already because there's nothing you can do for your child except just wait for them to get better on their own. After they brought her back, the provider came out, was like, this is what we did. These are the drugs that we gave her during the the code and I was like, that's actually not what happened. Was that like the head doctor you told? No, it wasn't the head, the doctor wasn't there. It was the nurse like practitioner. So like the person who's giving the orders, I told, she came out to tell me and I was like, that's actually not what happened. I was standing right there when the ventilator was telling us that she wasn't connected. And she was like, thank you for telling me. And at this point she goes and asks that nurse, like, is this what happened? Uh -huh. And then at that point, that's when the nurse like admits that yes, that is what happened. So she wasn't gonna admit it ever. No. She wasn't even gonna bring it up. After that, I was so livid. I was asking to talk to her supervisor because that yeah, like that's, that's not, just not okay. Like literally, uh, you could have cost someone's yeah, life. Yeah, and, like, I don't think she was brushing it off because it was an accident, though. It was it was carelessness. Yeah, it was so yeah. purposeful. You so know? you and think it when, was when it's carelessness, when when you just don't care enough. Yeah. It's different from an accident. So now you're talking to a supervisor. Yes. So at this point, I'm talking to a supervisor. To you, it may be just another day on the job. And really, sometimes I even told her, I was like, I understand where it can get like that. Because when you're on the job, like just over and over, it becomes kind of repetitive and you just treat it so repetitively and I get it. But then at the same time, I was like, you can't just keep letting her go into these cardiac arrests, keep making her heart stop and then bring her back. And then it's okay again, because at what point it's like, she's not going to be able to come back. To you, it might just be another day on the job, but I have to live with this for the rest of my life. Whether it be developmental, where she has issues, like I don't know, but to me this is forever. I was kind of offended by the way she took offense to it, because... She took offense? She did. The supervisor did? Yeah, she did. She was like, you know, we don't do this for the money or the glory. I never said that. We only do this because we care for our, all of our patients. And I'm just like, honestly, I'm offended that she's trying to tell me this because your nurse just did, showed me she didn't care. Yeah. Like, I mean, you can tell oh me a hundred times over that you care, but do something like that just shows me by your actions you don't care. The action of that was not even a new nurse that was kind of confused yes. and lost and like, oh my god, I don't really know what I'm doing, right? It was like a whatever type of nurse, like that not my so deal. Scary. And maybe the next yes. nurse. And will. then after I spoke to the supervisor and she gave me that kind of reaction, she brought that nurse in and the nurse comes into my room with her arms like this. What did she say? She was like, I didn't, her apology was a sorry, not sorry apology. And I mean, that's how I felt. Like I can only remember the first part of it because after that, I was so livid. I was probably shaking at this point. It was like 
someone apologizing to me for getting my fast food order wrong. Like that's how lightly she took it. Wait, Wait can, can I do the stance? I gotta oh, do the yeah, stance. Yeah, yeah. Show okay, the stance. Are you ready? That's how she stood? Yeah, that's how she stood. And I was sitting down, like just like this. Trying so hard not to lash out at this person. This whole situation just happened and I'm like, just trying so hard not to just like curse at her. She comes in, she has this aura of, or this energy of like, sorry, not sorry. She said, I did not tell them in the room while she was coding what happened but I did tell them after. And I was like, after I told somebody and they came and asked you about it, you told them. That to me is not like, you telling yeah. them. <laughs> if you had any intention of telling them, you would have told them in the room. To me, they were going through the motions because they had to, because I had expressed my co like complaint or concern to the supervisor and they had to. I was like, I'm not getting anywhere with her yeah. or her nurse supervisor, clearly. I just was fuming by myself in the room, like just so upset, but I couldn't leave. I'm not trying to offend anyone who takes care of patients because yeah. you know, we need nurses and we yeah. need doctors and yeah, I think everything. Like any it's, nurse who watches yes. this will not, like you know this is unacceptable and you know that you're not that type of nurse. Like this yes. is a It's not what? even like nurse, it's just like a human this, level. Yes. Human, yes. human level. Like what kind yes. of, you know what That's I mean. how I felt. And then for that person to be a nurse just made it like a yeah. hundred times worse. Like at the end of the day, I have like zero control over anything that happens and I'm just <coughs> watching as a parent. It's just so hard. I was like, okay, so I let it go. But then I just kept thinking about it. So the next day, I told the doc, I, it was the same doctor. And I was expressing to him again and I was like, I mean, I just, I'm so upset about the situation and I just want to know like what's being done so that this doesn't happen to anyone else after that incident. They were only going to give us experienced nurses and this and that. I was like, it's not okay for any parent to have to go through that kind of emotion where you can trust your nurse on a professional level, but worse, like you can't trust your nurse to be honest with whatever's happening medically to your child. Their whole thing was, okay, we'll get the nurse, like clinical manager or supervisor or something to come and talk to you. And I was like, okay, cause I want to know exactly what happened. They came in and she, and I vented to her. And honestly, I was so upset after this conversation and she was like listening, but she like wasn't. And then she was like, so what do you want? No. So like, what do I want? As if I'm asking her for money or something. The least you could do is listen to me at your event for 10 minutes. Is that not your job? Like you're pretend to do your job. Yeah. yeah. Managers at freaking grocery stores do this. And you're telling me that you work in a hospital dealing with patients who are dying yeah. and you can't even do that. And then she she actually asked for the uh, the printout of, of like the machine yeah. of like what happened. She wouldn't give that to us. Yeah, and she was like, oh, we can only get those that from the machine after she's disconnected from the machine, after she's discharged and whatever, and, and then whatever. What the next day? So the next day, I'm gonna be really honest with you. I did file a complaint with the joint commission. Well, yeah. yeah, why I mean, would yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, it was a patient safety complaint. Yeah. And so I guess the hospital takes that really seriously because after I did that, they came and took the ventilator out to look at the alarms the next day. After she told me, I she couldn't do that. So they finally did something after I mean, our complaint was yes. filed. No one should have to go through that. There needs to be steps that you guys are taking to make sure it doesn't happen again. I mean, yeah. Mia's still in the hospital and it shouldn't happen to other people. The kind of reaction that I got from like, not the doctor, cause he was very professional, but like the respiratory therapist manager or whatever, and the nurse manager, they were both asking me like, so what do you want? Like, hey, you put my life, like my child's life at risk because you didn't do your job. And they go, what do you want? I don't know, for you to do your job, like, 
just the bare minimum telling her like I want to know that something's being done like that you guys are looking into yeah. it and she's like yeah but I can't tell you whatever the policies are or whatever and it's just like so I can't know anything I can't know what happened why that happened I can't know that there is something being done this is the point that I was like okay I can't let it be internal because everyone's just brushing it under the rug so I'm like okay you're not taking any action I don't feel like anything's being done you still don't it. know what happened though. yeah and I still will never know yeah. and I mean I would never got like a real apology i guess i'm just upset because i never got that close and not it's weird to say closure but like it is closure yeah like, like, you can't move on yeah it's just yeah. so hard to move on when you don't know that something was done i never got a real apology and you said you can't I even mean, sue them right oh yeah so i, mean, I know the comments are going to be flooded with like sue them like, expose them so for the suing we reached out to a ton of attorneys and this is what's crazy they're like, unless she's permanently injured or dead, you're shit out of luck. And that's why I feel like they come out with these attitudes because they yeah. know that. And they work for this big hospital, which I'm sure has like crazy I attorneys. Know. Yeah. And that's why she comes into the room with this kind of attitude. But the thing is like, she almost died twice. Yes. And she could have life. So Life we don't know, yeah. Brain damage, but you don't know that and until then, later. So you can't use that. No. no. You can't talk about it. They they have no, no liability. And then watch till later they're gonna be like, we don't know what happened in the past yeah. two years. She, mm -hmm. You could have dropped her on her head. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Honestly, my sister's not going back there. We're not going there with our future children. But it's just like, she's so upset because I think as like her being a mom going through that, the idea of another mom going through that same thing because of a nurse's carelessness is just mind-boggling. Also, side note, can I just say, I don't think I've ever told you this, the progression of my sister's phone calls were out of this world during those two, like, three weeks. I know, okay. it's probably, like, so crazy. <laughs> In the beginning, she was just so devastated, like, just bawling her eyes out on the phone, and then I was bawling my eyes out. And then we went into, like, a numb stage, where she was kind of robotic, just, like, telling me the updates. My mom said every day she went in there, there was just, like, empty cans of Red Bull crushed up. And then it went, into anger my sister but she couldn't even take it out on the hospital really because Mia's still there yeah she was fueled by anger I think yeah. she stayed up at night oh my fueled god by and anger. you say that nurse later on came back to take care of Mia yes oh yeah she came to apologize yeah. and then this apology mind you they have to like come back every two hours because yeah. we're in the ICU to do vitals and do all this stuff and like, she kept coming back into our room to help Mia. And I later was so confused as to why she kept doing that throughout her shift. And I was like, I asked the nurse, like the supervisor, I was like, so like, did the other supervisor think that I accepted that apology because I didn't? And she was like, no, she knew you didn't. And then I was like, then why did the nurse keep coming back into our room? My child needs them, so I can't like cause a scene. They tell you, like my sister was telling me, you know, the hospitals tell you as a parent or guardian, you need to advocate for your child's safety because Mia can't even crawl, she can't even talk, right? But at the same time, it almost feels like anytime you advocate for your child's safety, you get pushed back. And yeah. you feel like, when is the level when I'm pushing too hard yes. that they're just gonna immediately be like, okay, I don't care about your kid then. Because that's kind of the territory that it seemed to be heading. Like yes. that is so scary. You can only say so much. Yes. And also, another thing is listening to all of this, like my sister's a pharmacist. She has way more knowledge on like basic human anatomy and all these like medical terms that just over my head. If that were me in there, I don't know if I would even notice what they did. And that's so scary because how many parents are healthcare workers? Also, yeah. imagine your parents who don't have really good like careers where, you know, their employers are like, yeah, you can take time off. You don't have someone there 24-7. Yeah. Or like if you don't, if you're a parent and you have to watch your other child. Yeah. So before all of this happened, like one of my coworkers like told me like, oh, you know, I had an experience where my daughter was like in the NICU and I was just praying for her, you know, all the time. And I was like, I could only imagine what she like went through. I felt bad for her and I empathized with her, but I like never knew like what it really felt like until like I went through it myself. And now 
I was just I just feel for those parents I even felt bad like being I felt like I was being dramatic but like at the end of the day it doesn't matter because if your child doesn't come out of the hospital healthy you're just advocating for your child's you know patient safety okay I did I tried not to ask too many questions you know because they got out everyone was trying to be happy again but I didn't know it was like to this infuriating level I only yes. got like bits and pieces from mommy but I'm gonna go hug Mia now. <laughs> I'm literally oh, hug Mia now. She's good. She's so good. She's, it's Mia! Hello! It was really weird. So, I mean, after they, she got off the ventilator and she was doing good, but you know, with all the sedation medications, she did have like go through a little uh, withdrawal phase and she was not very happy with that, but oh, yeah. she was. She's she, cracked out, man. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Yeah. After the withdrawals ended, yeah. it was just like this. And then she was, I was like, oh, she's laughing. She's happy. Oh, yeah, she's yeah. a giggler. Yeah, and after yeah. that, it was. Because Sophie, I've only seen Sophie go. <laughs> you see, like, the smirks. Yeah. I yeah. mean, she's, like, feeding more, like, normal. And she seems healthy. That's the only <laughs> reason why I could even do this video. Yeah. I mean, I don't really think that I could have talked about it if. You know, yeah. she wasn't healthy at this point. At the same time, I think it's really important to raise awareness for patient safety because, I mean, that's so important. Like, as a parent, like, that's all you can even ask for is, like, yeah. the safety of your children. I can't say I hope you guys enjoyed this video because we have not been enjoying our lives for a while. <laughs> But we're back on track. Yes. We're enjoying it again. Be aware, be vigilant, and like we really hope nothing like this ever happens to you to guys. Anyone. But if it does, just freaking hot guys, everything. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye. We love you. Give your love to Mia and Sophie, please. Yes. <laughs>